Today I'm here with Shuji Hisano, a Kyoto professor in political economy and agriculture. Um, hi Shuji, how are you? Hey, I'm fine. Um, I want to ask you first about the political economy of food. What is, what is the status today? Um, the status of uh, political economy of food is uh, usually described as a corporate food regime. That means the food system, agricultural production, agricultural distribution, food uh, dis distribution of food, and also consumption patterns are influenced by uh, corporate sector, corporate actors. And uh, political economy is uh, kind of field of social sciences that uh, dealing with the interaction between the process of economy and the process of policy making. And uh, not just uh, farmers and consumers and other actors uh, influenced by uh, uh, corporations, but policy making processes and the implementation processes are also influenced and uh, yeah, influenced by uh, corporations. That is uh, what the corporate food regime usually means. So are you looking at the large scale or also grassroots such as a Via Campesina or other groups like that? So, uh, both. Because, yeah, uh, many uh, social movements are uh, rooted on the ground at the local, but uh, they cannot uh, distance themselves from what is taking place at the national, regional, and uh, global level. Mm -hmm. So, like Via Campesina is uh, nowadays a global peasant movement, and they are uh, actively participating. Uh, they participate in uh, international fora of uh, food issues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on the one hand, I'm personally uh, looking at the global governance of food. Uh, especially focusing on the, the activities of transnational agribusiness corporations. But at the, on the other hand, I, we need to look at uh, social, the emerging uh, global uh, peasant movements. It's uh, now uh, expanding from the local to the global. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we need to look at both the global uh, big scale, macro scale, uh, issues and the local scale issues. What are the big agri agribusinesses that you speak of? What are the uh, Cargill? Yes, Cargill, uh, Monsanto, uh, Unilever, or Nestle, or yeah, whatever else. Uh, so the agribusiness industry is uh, very complex because uh, it's not just just one uh, field of uh, industry sector. It's uh, ranging from uh, agricultural input sector like a seed or agrochemical or fertilizer uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, primary processing and uh, trade sector like uh, yeah, Cargill and Bunge, also ADM, and also food processors like uh, Nestle and uh, yeah, Unilever, and food retailers like uh, uh, Walmart and uh, sometimes include uh, the food service sector like uh, Mac McDonald's. So very uh, uh, broad area and uh, each sector has its own logic and uh, sometimes we need to pr uh, differentiate yeah, yes. when we uh, analyze. In, but, uh, yeah. in this case, right. uh, can you talk about the difference between, say, food security and food sovereignty? It's a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, usually we use the food security. It's a very common, and uh, yeah, everybody knows that concept. But uh, and uh, the, this concept. Uh, first originated in 1970s when the World Food, Se uh, World Food Conference was held in 1974 to tackle the food crisis at the time. And the food security concept was at the time focused on the 
the food availability and also the price volatility. And but largely based on the national and the international level. And in 1980s, the concept was broadened to include uh, individual and uh, household food security. But at the same time, in 1980s and 90s, the food security concept has been gradually manipulated by uh, neoliberal uh, way of thinking, like uh, you know the WTO and uh, World Bank and IMF kind. Uh, 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 neoliberalistic global, uh, globalization regime. They also mentioned food security, but for them, uh, food free trade and uh, international uh, capital investment are um, important means for food security because uh, food availability can be uh, achieved by free trade, they insist. So instead of using food security concept. In 1996, the, the global social movement, including uh, La Bia Campesina, uh, advocated the another alternative concept to describe the food security, and they coined the concept of food sovereignty. Yes, it's a very different, and uh, one of their criticism against the food security is it in the food security concept it is uh, it is uh, so the food availability is mentioned and the food uh, production increase of food production is mentioned but they nevertheless uh, avoid to uh, clarify how where by whom food should be uh, produced and in what way they should be distributed. So uh, food sovereignty concept uh, is uh, focused on the alternative model of agriculture and the food distribution. So, that, so this, uh, these two concepts are very different. But in my opinion, uh, food sovereignty is very powerful and uh, because of uh, because this concept is uh, developed, uh, uh, produced and dis developed by uh, the, the social movement rooted on the ground. But at the same time, this concept still remains as a political one-way slogan. They just insist. Although the, this concept is nowadays uh, accepted by in the international uh, community, especially at uh, some part of the United Nations, but still, the, the food sovereignty is a political slogan. So that's why I'm uh, uh, nowadays very interested in another concept of uh, the right to food. The right to food is an internationally recognized uh, legal framework. Yes. So uh, I think the food sovereignty and the concept of food sovereignty and the uh, food sovereignty move, movement uh, should be and could be uh, strengthened and uh, legitimized by use of this uh, recognized legal framework of uh, the rights to food. I see. Yeah. When I think of a political economy of food, I, of course, think back to Adam Smith. Uh, how about market inefficiencies? For example, sending massive amounts of corn from the United States to Mexico when Mexico yeah. is the land race for corn. That's where corn was founded. Uh, yes. How is it possible to send uh, ship, shiploads of corn to Mexico when it can be grown right there in the backyard of the peasant? Uh, so for example, GMO corn or non-GMO corn uh, sent to Mexico or trucked to Mexico uh, is quite inefficient, right? When it yeah. can be grown in Mexico, and that's the home of corn in the first yes. place. Yeah. Yes. In uh, economic term, the 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 efficiency as so the in a mainstream discourse, the efficiency is a very important uh, aspect. 
but of course the, the to produce uh, corn and uh, wheat and other crops in the United States or in Brazil or in Australia is much more efficient uh, but uh, in terms of sustainability I think the efficiency is uh, uh, not very good because uh, in the long term the you know the um, uh, the Efficient model of agricultural production in the United States, for example, is uh, quite monoculture, characteristic, and uh, not not very sustainable. And they are very vulnerable, vulnerable to the the climate change or the spread of some kind of diseases or bugs. And uh, in Mexico, it's uh, because of the origin of corn. They have uh, very diverse uh, varieties on the ground, and uh, but the small sc uh, the scale of farmers are very small, and in terms of economic uh, economy, they are not efficient. But in the long term, they are very uh, efficient in a different way. It's, I mean the sustainability. So. But uh, now, nowadays, uh, now the, the, the logic, the market, uh, the logic of uh, market is overwhelming. And uh, that's why the, the corns are produced and shipped to uh, Mexico, where the corn uh, are actually uh, ultimated. Yeah. You, you've done a lot of work with the genetically modified uh, food plants. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the status today of, of this particular area? Uh, the, um, so the gen, uh, genetic modified crops uh, first uh, developed and commercialized in 1996, around 1996. Since then, the, the production of GM crops have been rapidly expanding, and uh, I forget the detailed uh, figure of the scale of lands. But now, no, no. let me check. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, now very vast acreage of uh, farmland are covered by uh, GM crops, and especially in the United States. More than 90% of soybeans, corns, uh, not corn, uh, 90, 80 or 90% of uh, corn and soybeans and uh, cottons are already uh, replaced by uh, GM varieties. And the United States is one of the most biggest producer and exporter of these main crops. And that, mean, that means that the crops uh, available in the international market are already mostly uh, GM crops. So uh, the countries like Japan or South Korea who uh, depend on heavily depend on import of these crops. Mm -hmm.